Welcome back to Fae Fire. Today we will be taking a deeper look at the Fae race of people and how they are portrayed in Cursed. The Fae are an ostracized group of indigenous people who we see being decimated by the Red Paladins of Rome as they work to spread Christianity through the lands in Britain. King Uther Pendragon, who rules the land, is less focused on protecting the Fae than he is on becoming a powerful and influential king who is free of the power of Rome. There are many Fae clans represented in Cursed, each with unique appearances and characteristics. As a group, they are inherently tied to the land and animals in a variety of ways. Let's explore the different clans and how they differentiate from one another. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to Fae Fire to join the Fae Underground. We can start with one clan who, in the book, may have nearly gone extinct. These are the Ash Folk, and the one character we meet from that clan is the Weeping Monk. He is almost able to pass for human, other than the ash-colored markings around his eyes. Ash Folk have the ability to camouflage their skin to blend with their surroundings. While we don't know if this is something they can tap into by choice, we see it happen when they are injured. This ability comes almost as a second nature to vanish from their attacker and blend with their surroundings. They also have a keen sense of smell and can use this for hunting or finding their own kind. In the book, it is said the Ash Folk have not been seen in the area for hundreds of years, which is likely why Father Cardin thinks he can get away with having the Weeping Monk right under the other paladin's noses. In the show, we meet a young boy from an Ash clan whose village is under attack by the Red Paladins. The village is decimated, but Father Cardin does collect information from his encounter with the boy. The show does not state that the Ash folk are extinct, only that they have not been seen in those lands for centuries, so this may leave room for the Weeping Monk to find more of his own kind in the future. The Sky Folk, also known as Sun Dancers, are the clan that Nimue hails from. They have a strong connection with the Hidden, particularly their clan elders, and a focus on the old gods. Lenore, Nimue's mother, is the archdruid of their clan. Though Lenore has confided in Nimue that many of the elders' connection to the Hidden is weak, Nimue's connection is even stronger than Lenore's. Nimue is chosen by the Hidden as Summoner, who will one day become Archdruid, though she tells the elders she does not want it. The Hidden are invisible nature spirits who work through some of the Sky Folk to send a message about a harvest, summon the rain, or bless a birth. Many of the Sky Folk believe their clan is descended from these spirits. The Hidden appear on their faces, called the Fingers of Aramid, showing as green vines and leaves. When a person dies, the green leaves change to autumn colors, orange and red. The Sky Folk are well-known farmers and have a close connection with nature and growing plants. Nimue, Gawain, and Squirrel also display the ability to subtly communicate with animals. The Sky Folk honor the hidden and make offering at the Sunken Temple in Duden. The Sky Folk also seem to have strong healing abilities, and both Pym and Nimue recognize Lenore as a great healer, though Merlin calls her a fancy midwife to peasants when she could have been something much greater. There is definitely some symbolism of Lenore in her position as the Archdruid of the Sky Folk and of the Sunken Temple as a parallel to the position of the Lady of the Lake, or High Priestess of Avalon, as seen throughout Arthurian lore. This subtly hints at the duality of the position of Lady of the Lake in contrast to Nimue's expected future role as Lady of the Lake and Keeper of the Sword of Power. The Tusk Clan are the warriors of the Fae. They have actual tusks that protrude from their jowls and they are a fierce group. Their war blood runs hot, which unfortunately has contributed to the negative propaganda against the Fae. They do not often speak the common tongue, which makes communication difficult and tensions easily riled. One of the most interesting and exciting elements of the tusks is that they use giant tusked boars in warfare, large enough to ride. 
In the book, there is a great scene of a battle at a glade where the Fae lure a group of red paladins into a village square and use the boar to attack them. Using his giant tusks to sweep through the paladins, the tusk warriors, following their war boar, easily kill the soldiers in its wake. Nimue is put in a difficult position by a Tusk clan member when he murders a townsperson in Grammaire. Roth, the clan leader, excuses it by saying he has war blood, but Nimue is forced to punish the unapologetic warrior by cutting off his hands. This of course drives a dangerous divide between the Fae clans, but Arthur is able to resolve the conflict by offering his own hands in return, though thankfully Roth doesn't take them. The Tusks agree to peace in order to save all the Fae and work together to make their way to the ships provided by King Uther. The Fae needed the Tusk warriors to protect them on their way to the ships and again in the unexpected fight on the beach with the Vikings of Cumber the Ice King. Roth is killed in this battle on the beach, which leaves the leadership for the Tusk people open for the future book and seasons. The Moonwings are a group of people who live in the tree canopies. Many of them have never set foot on the ground. They have homes and hammocks among the trees, and this is how they are preyed upon. The Red Paladins burn them out, lighting forests aflame, then slaughtering them on the ground. A young Moonwing brings news of this to Duden early in the story, showing that the Moonwings and Skyfolk are neighboring clans. In the book, the Moonwings are portrayed as having painted blue skin and long spindly limbs, tattoos, and many shave their heads. Their skin camouflages as needed to hide in their homes in the trees. They do not have wings or feathers, but are very connected to birds, and we saw this heavily in the character of Yiva, the sorceress Moonwing. She has a menagerie of birds from puffins to hawks, owls to eagles, who live amongst her and are very perceptive to the power of the hidden. It is well known the snakes are their blood enemies. The Moonwings live in cave ceilings in Nemos, but once the Fae move to Grammaire, they have a difficult time acclimating. It was not as easy to find high perches to stay on within city walls, and some of the Grammaire locals would find them hiding in the rafters of their own homes. The Moonwings are generally peaceful and shy people who keep to themselves. Even in Duden, it is extremely rare to encounter them. Squirrel is particularly excited by the prospect of ever even getting to see one, so the young Moonwing who wanders into Duden was definitely an omen of a major event to come. The Fawn Folk are peaceful people who seem to dedicate their time towards the comforts and everyday necessities of life. They are known to make clothing, harvest grain, bake foods, and provide the comfort and escape of entertainment to the Fae, even while hiding in Nemos. They have a gentle disposition, are excellent archers, and ride great stags. The Fawn maintain the food and distribution to all refugees in the caves. It seems maintaining a comfortable and peaceful way of life is of the utmost importance to them, and they even go as far as having a joining ceremony amidst the stress and chaos of being refugees. They honor Nimue for her achievements by giving her a dress and tiara, and do the same in gratitude to Morgana. The fawn are connected to deer in appearance. They have antlers and a sweet spotted face similar to a fawn. The fawn are the folk we hear of who cut their devil horns in order to pass for more human-like. Without their antlers, they can pretty much pass for a man-blood, unlike the tusks who would have a harder time hiding their tusk markings. The snake clan are a group of people who live in swampy areas. Their skin has evolved to become scaled and capable of withstanding wet environments. It is said they live in skin tents beneath the water and they worship the night. They wear bat skin masks and paint their faces with guano. The snakes are very capable fighters, moving quickly and striking hard. They don't get along with many of the other clans and don't often speak the common tongue. Yeva has some issues with the snakes once they all live together in Nemos. Someone has been eating her birds, and she warns them that some of her birds fill their bellies on snakes. The Plogs play a small part in the story and are a very mysterious people. Nimue recalls scary stories from her childhood about their two-fingered, sharp-clawed hands digging in perpetual darkness. 
They live underground and burrow tunnels in the wet earth that could swallow a person up and be filled in before anyone could ever know it existed. This comes into play during the battle at the Glade when the Plogs help the Fae escape after the fight by creating underground tunnels for the Fae to leave the battleground, thus preventing the Paladins from following them to their hideout. The plan works masterfully. In the book, a Plog named Effie burrows a tunnel for Morgana and smuggles her out of the city with the sword, similarly to what we saw in episode 10. Some of the more minor Fae clans are the Stormcrafters, who are tattooed head to toe and are reputed for their rain summoning. The Cliffwalkers, who are a shy clan who live in the mountains. Their men wear helms of ram horn, and the women decorate themselves in intricate scars. The Bahare. This is a guess at the clan which Kaze comes from. The clan name is not given in the book, but in the show, Kaze references the Bahare when warning Nimue and Morgana away from the caves of the Kailiach. Kaze has a lot of cat-like features, including sharp teeth and claws, and a long tail, which she keeps hidden under her rich purple robes. She's a very capable and confident fighter, and she tells Nimue her people are ruled by queens. And there we have it, an introduction to the Fey clans. I will do another video with a look at deeper Fey history throughout Cursed, including Merlin's flashbacks to fighting in Rome, as well as the Fey represented throughout Arthurian lore. There's plenty of Fey history to discuss, and be sure you are subscribed to the channel as we explore Cursed and other Arthuriana. Ring that notification bell and set your reminders for the Fey Underground on Friday nights with me, Fey Fire, and my trusty summoner, Mandolinway. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.